Hi, this is Rabbi David Debo with a visual of our Torah. Uh, we have a lot to say in little time, so we're going to jump right in. We're talking about Parshat Shlach and honest reporting. Now, as you all know, I'm sure, Rabbi Leo D. lost his wife and two daughters in a terrorist attack uh, just a couple months ago. He is suing CNN for $1.3 billion. Actually, he's just considering at this point but suing them for $1.3 billion because CNN reported the incident as a shootout. Christiane Anna Mampour said that they died in a shootout. Now, later on, she apologized and said she misspoke. But uh, Rabbi D, together with his lawyer, uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz, it's clear that this is not a simple mistake. This is a function of a long-standing editorial policy at CNN to make a moral equivalency, to not ever commit to saying that one side is wrong and the Israeli song is, is, is right, but to make terrorists equal to Israeli citizens. And so, of course, there has to be a shootout. There has to be something on both sides, which is ridiculous. These were um, innocent people driving home, gunned down in cold blood. What it shows is that there was a pre-conceived uh, notion that was behind the way they reported the incident. And I want to take that idea directly into our parsha. The Parsha really is about honest reporting. And if we look carefully, there are only three verses that record exactly what happened uh, when the spies went ahead and toured Eretz Yisrael. It begins in verse 21, and this is not reporting what they said, this is reporting what happened in the narrator third person. They went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Tzin to Rehov to the entrance of Hamat. They went up by the south and came to Hebron, and Achiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were there. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Tzuan in, e in Egypt. They came to the valley of Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bore it on a staff between two. They also brought some, of the pomegranate, some pomegranate and figs. And that's it. That's all the Torah has to say about actually what happened. Then they go into reporting to what the spies report, what Kalev and Yoshua report against them, the ten against the two. But I want to focus on really analyzing these few three verses and what they have to tell us. Um, so we really get three points out of these verses. There are giants that live in Israel. The Hebron is old, ancient. And there are big fruit that grow in the land. But the Torah chose not to tell us those three important points directly. Instead, the Torah chose to give this information to us in very, I'm going to call it objective detail. Watch carefully. What do we know from the verse that tells us that giants live in the land? Well, it says, Yilidei Ha'anak, the children of the giant, the known giant. We're not going to tell you that Sheshai, Achiman, Betamai are giants themselves. We're going to say there's some giant that we all recognize live there, and Sheshai, Achiman, Betamai, they were children of those giants. Um, we're not going to tell you about how old uh, Hebron is. All we're going to tell you is there's a reference point, Tzuan Mitzrayim, and Hebron was seven years older than that. And we're not going to tell you about how big the fruit is. There's no object adjective in that sentence whatsoever. All we're going to say is that do we agree that fruit that requires at least two people, maybe eight people, the way Rashi describes it, to carry it on staffs is big fruit? Well, if we agree on that, that's the kind of fruit that were carried out of Eretz Yisrael. Three points. Giants live in the land. The reference, some known giant. Hebron is old. The reference, so on in Egypt. To talk about an agreed point of age. And Hebron, seven years before that. Big fruit. No, we're not going to say that, but the reference is fruit that requires two people to carry it on a staff. Um, and that, of course, is the Israeli Ministry of Tourism, La Tour et Aretz, to go ahead and wander around. What are we supposed to make of this very careful phrasing in Parshat Shlach? I think the idea is really clear. Whenever you report something, 
the words that you choose, whether you're going to make reference to the fact that those gunmen were terrorists, or you don't make reference to the fact that those gunmen that killed the D children and the D wife were terrorists, it is always a choice and it always reflects a belief system. Use the word terrorist, that puts you into one belief system. Don't use the word terrorist, that puts you in another belief system. You're saying in some way that those people deserve to die. You're saying in some way that these are not terrorists, which means that they had some sort of legitimacy going out there and gunning these people down in cold blood. Rashi makes this point explicitly back in the Parsha. Um, at the end, the 10 spies drop all pretense and they say quite clearly, Chazak hu mimenu. They are stronger than mimenu, which pshat, or a simple reading is, than we, than we are. They're stronger than we are. We can't do it. We can't uh, conquer this land. But Rashi says they were really speaking against God. Chazak hu mimenu means they were stronger than God. How does Rashi make this jump? The answer is, whenever you want to go ahead and report on something, whenever you want to say how strong, how big, how powerful something is, you're always choosing points of reference. You're always reflecting an inner understanding of what you think to be strong and then making a reference from that. The Torah did it very carefully when it wanted to describe from the objective third person how old, how big, and how giant those people were. But when it came to the spies, what it was saying was, we are reflecting an underlying disbelief in our power and by extension God's power to bring us into the land. And that is a problem of Emunah. Clearly, CNN doesn't believe in the legitimacy of Eretz Israel to be here, which is why they can call such a thing a shootout. We must have that belief strong. We must know that we belong here, that God is on our side, that God grant us this land and will eventually give us the strength, the power, the prosperity, the wisdom, Be'ezrat Hashem, to do what we need to do to hold on to this land for perpetuity for a long time. <laughs> Please God, may we see the redemption speedily in our day where our uh, living here is clearly recognized by all the nations of the world. Shabbat Shalom.